Good Sunday evening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Talking TSR, episode number 42, as we were mentioning back in the green room. We joke about that as if there's really a green room, um, because everybody knows it's blue. Um, (laughs) But like, we're just joking. It's like we do something 42 times, you get pretty good at it after a while. So uh, we are back again um, to my virtual left, as always, unless he's on my virtual right, uh, is my awesome co-host, Rick. Rick, say hi to everybody. Hi, Chris. Glad to be back with you. Yeah, we're in the we're in the groove, I think, at this point, aren't we? So I, I think so too. We we shook off the rust uh from our first show of the year back in yep. the groove. It, and it would not be um Feels good. You know, it, it would not be a talking TSR episode without G Blaster in the chat already firing up the the the, the chat and, and and already uh on his knees worshiping the beard. Gotta throw that out. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I you know. I was transporting down to a planet, hit a magnetic storm, you know, came back up on the wrong enterprise. And, you know, this is the version you get for now. So there, there it is. We'll see there how it long is. it lasts. You know, this is the alternate Rick. So awesome. 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 So a couple of uh, um, announcements before we jump into things. Uh, the first thing is, is if you guys are not aware, uh, we are running an Indiegogo campaign right now for volumes one and two of the adventure module manual. Uh, so that is uh, compilations of um, our fifth edition fantasy books, uh, numbers one through seven and numbers eight through 15. Um, I wrote a fair number of them. And I think, Rick, you even wrote one. You wrote the one with the beholder on the front, right? The zombie yes. beholder. Yep. Yeah. So, um, which I think we're going to use for the cover, I think, for number two, I think, is what we're tending Sweet. towards. So, yeah, so uh, guys, uh, there is uh, Elena, the awesome producer extraordinaire behind the glass. Uh, we'll drop the uh, the Indiegogo um, link in the chat if you guys want to check that out. Um, secondly, uh, I, I know you guys are probably so tired of me saying this, but uh, the Dungeon Denizens Kickstarter is coming soon. It's coming next month. And spoiler alert, the month starts on Wednesday um it's not going to be that early though it's going to be more towards the end of the month but um we have another link that we're uh, going to drop in the chat as well um where you can actually follow along uh for our page and i see we already have well over a thousand people following um, nice. our kickstarter before it has even launched so that's amazing news um and and i just want to tell you folks i just want to tell you we are go- we're, we are pulling out all the stops for this Kickstarter. We have so many cool things. We are doing weekly meetings. We are changing up what we're doing. We are we're on this one, all over this one, um, like ants on jelly. Uh, we are giant ants, obviously, um, <laughs> on, on jelly. Uh, but yeah, so it's going to be great. So uh, folks, hopefully uh, check that out. Um, Rick, what's going on? What's happening in your world, man? Uh, life has been good. Uh, gaming regularly, which I'm happy to say. Um, in my own campaign, uh, I have my players in the village of Hamlet, so they have cleared, they've just cleared out the top level of the moat house, and they are just going down the stairs, uh, nice. to eventually meet uh, a certain aquatic encounter, hopefully, and, and Larith the Beautiful, nice. uh, within a week or two, so I'm pretty psyched about that, talk about old school gaming at its finest, so, uh, I'm very interested to see how that comes out, so stay tuned. Cool, cool. Uh, G Blaster, yes, of course, there will be a special edition cover option for Dungeon Denizens. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and it's not something we've done before. So uh yeah, we're 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 it's gonna be pretty cool. We're we're getting we're we're really really dipping into the deep end of the pool on things that you can do with covers and that it's really fascinating. We've been the last year or so. We've been talking with printers about different things that they could do. There's all these crazy things they can do that like nobody ever does. Um, but we're nuts, so we're like doing it. So <laughs> a good um, nuts. Yes. So awesome. So how's your world been, Chris? It's been it's been good. Um, it seems like it's kind of settled into a nice, a nice um after the holidays pace. Uh weather mm-hmm. still, still doesn't feel like it's totally winter yet, but that's fine. Yep. Um, I've got some trips planned coming up. Um, but no, it, it's it, it it's all good. I mean, right now I'm doing some uh, regular gaming. Um, it was uh, we, we had a really fun session actually um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so originally in this super secret play test I was doing, which has been going on for over a year now, um, my son had to drop out of it because of 
work and school. Imagine that mm, he's wow. doing adult things. So yeah, um, he's got a job where he works on the weekends now and um, we couldn't change the time. So, but it was really cool. We set up a session. So we wanted to finish his character's arc off. His character just kind of went off and did some stuff. Um, and his character was like hell bent on revenge. So it was really cool. You mm. love what we did to kind of end uh, his character's arc. Um, we, we, and my son and I on our walks, we planned this all out and everything. We had him go try to go defeat his nemesis down in the dungeon, um, failed, got killed. And I brought him back as a revenant mm. and then he came back as a revenant and then went back to the party of adventures and said, I need some help. And wow. basically came back for a, a special guest appearance, one session. Mm -hmm. And, and we went and they went and they beat up the bad guy and, and ended his arc and got his, let his character's soul rest in peace. Um, and it was a fun time. It was a really, it was a cool combat. And uh, the characters are like fifth level now. So um, nice. they've got, you know, abilities all over the place. And uh, they keep me on my toes. They keep me on my uh -huh. toes, so which is good. So having a great good. time. Um, all right. Uh, so we are here tonight to talk about uh, Dungeon Module G2, the Glacial Rift of the Frost Giant Jarl. Um, a great title. So we're going to kick off right with an awesome title. I, I love the title. I remember back in the uh, early 80s when I first saw the word Jarl, I didn't know what that was. <laughs> yeah. I looked that up, uh, which was kind of neat. Um, D&D made me do that too. I remember looking up what the word niche meant and uh, all kinds of things. <laughs> uh, uh, coffer, snuff box. I'm trying to think. We should do a show just on terms yes. that we didn't know it's that we had to learn. Jape. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, you know, Again, sleeping jape from the temple. Yes. I had a look. Yeah, D and D yeah. was very good for our vocabulary as kids, oh, yeah. wasn't it? And, oh, it was and I, I love the way with the titles of these that the title kind of goes up. You know, you you yes. start with chief, and then you go to jarl, yep. and you go to king. Yeah, yep. you get all that. Yeah, I I do I, I I do really really appreciate that. So yeah, so this is going to be a a fun one to talk about. So I guess uh, Rick, get us kicked off. Yeah. Tell me your your high sure. level view of this adventure. Yeah, well, high level view. Um, this was obviously a very early module, you know, among the very first that came out from TSR. Uh, it started out uh, as an Origins, you know, it was the Origins tournament in 1978. Yes. Um, and it shows, you know, it's kind of very heavy on combat, very few role playing encounters. So, you know, it is a lot of brutal combat and it can be tough. Um, this was interestingly reviewed by the late don turnbull in uh white dwarf it was white dwarf nine which was october november in 1978 and among other things he said about the whole series mind you the whole giant series he said no dm should be without them for even if they he never gets a chance to run them they are a source of much excellent design advice and it really is true when you think yeah. of how short these giant modules are and yet how much detail gygax kind of pushed into those pages it's it's wonderful you know um i mean we've we talked last time about brevity this is obviously another really brief one you know it's even I, shorter it's yeah even shorter yeah and and g blaster already brought that up he says four pages or something it's five and a half pages if you yeah. take out the art um and and everything it is it is five and a half pages of text which is crazy up mm -hmm. um 51 encounters in yeah, five and a half pages. Which is amazing. And, and, you know, in my mind, I had it not many more pages, but I always thought of these as, I guess, because I'm thinking signatures or print signatures or something. I thought of eight pages. Yeah. But then, yeah, on rereading, when I went back, I looked, I said, well, that page is pretty much just an image. And then when yep. you get past the intro text and, and you know, the preamble, when you get down to the quote unquote good stuff, it's like you said, you're basically under six pages, which is mm -hmm. just incredible that you have a two level layer a good two level layer yeah in five and a half pages you know that that's the way it's done folks um it's yeah. a, you know there's a lot to be said with evolution i think of presentation and and you know obviously these these old modules you know things have evolved the way we, we don't jumble everything together in descriptions and things anymore and yet i i still though am somehow awed of how much they pack into those you know few pages you know when you when, when we think of how many you know encounters and memories and things you can get out of this little tiny book so yeah to you know. totally totally um what do you think of the art in this one uh not a whole lot of art i think we have like 
five or six uh you know pieces plus obviously the cover in the back now you do have two good artists uh interestingly the artists are not credited in this but you, going by the signatures and the style it's pretty obviously Sutherland and David A Trampier um I I am delighted because I'm a Trampier fan I like both artists I have mm -hmm. no problem with neither one obviously but I'm a really big Trampier fan, so the fact that so many things, including the cover image, which maybe maybe the giants on the cover don't scream Trampier, but that is a Trampier piece too. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm totally happy with the art as far as you know the look and the style. Um, yeah, you know, especially uh, like the Remoraz image because mm -hmm. here you have basically the same artist who did it in the Monster Manual, so it looks just like it came out of the Monster Manual with that wonderful almost you know block art kind of style you know mm -hmm. of Trampiers with just the heavy blacks and the heavy inking I, I love I could look at that image all day long so yeah uh yeah right. given the brevity of the art I'm totally happy with it yeah I I agree um I I again when you're only talking about eight pages total it, it's kind of hard to get a lot of art in there but they still manage they still managed a full page piece which is great mm -hmm. and then also uh, there's a great classic piece in um, it's I don't think it was in the original adventure it was for the the title page for the uh, G1 through 3 where you've got the ice toads coming off the ledge yes yes um, and that was and I remember that I mean mm -hmm. again I, I said we always talk about this what's that one thing you think about when you when when you when you say an, an adventure name and it's like those ice toads coming off that ledge is what I always go right to every yeah. single time because that picture just you know, a lot of the a lot of the pictures, a lot of the original art didn't show a lot of action for obvious mm -hmm. reasons. You know, it was more like here's something or here's something static. Um, yeah. But that one was like, you know, the toads were coming mm -hmm. right off the right off the ledge, and and the perspective kind of looking down yeah. um, at the PCs. That was that was absolutely great. Um, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't I, I I couldn't get enough of that kind of artwork. But I'd really like to call attention to, and I think we've got this. I think Elena, if you can throw this one up. Um, we've got the entrance cavern, which was the full page art by Sutherland. Um, yeah. And and it was just like, again, you have such a, I mean, who would ever design an eight page book and then say, well, we're going to have a full page piece of yeah. art. And, and it's like, and, and it's really not even an important part of the adventure. I mean, it is the entrance cavern, but it's not showing like a couple of, 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 frost giants you know with axes yeah. waiting to defend you it's it's like a it's like a mural or a, a carving on the on the wall mm -hmm. um but it just it, it just it, you know again it's just one of those things that just kind of takes you back and is like wow that's just like that they had that the bold move to well it was either a bold move or it was like a uh oh we need to fill a page <laughs> <laughs> quick somebody do some art instead of typing a right. whole bunch of words for everything that was done I you know hopefully it wasn't that hopefully it was this really cool piece of art and I mean I, I'll you know in the, in the original that was spread over two that was a yes a, it was right bold, in the middle right? of the book yeah. yeah and it was like there was a stapling the and then when they redid it in uh, G1 through 3 mm -hmm. um, it was its own like when they moved it yeah. over to that so yeah that was, I can only imagine back that day doing that spread like that that must have been like typesetting that must have been um, a nightmare but you know yeah, but that, you know, that, you only had eight pages, so how hard yeah. could it have been? <laughs> so. uh, yeah, who knows what the typesetting was like at the point they did these? They were probably doing them on a light table or something, you know, as opposed to the way we think of it today. You know, no InDesign then, so yeah, uh, yeah, a whole different animal. But th the book holds up. It's it certainly certainly does. So um, I want to talk about the maps next. So um, mm -hmm. you get two two full dungeon levels on this, um, and and this is. It's a little bit different. It's not your, well, I shouldn't say it's a little bit different. I think I would say it's a lot a bit different. Yep. Uh, it's not a classic dungeon crawl. Um, you're basically going through, there's a rift. Um, so top of a mountain, if you will. Um, and then actually the whole first level is, is got that rift kind of going down the center of it um, yeah. where it's kind of an open area and there's basically some, some moving kind of moving encounters and you can run into things down in the rift. And then there's a series of caves you go to, and most of them are all hooked up to each other. So you get a little yeah. bit of a, a B2 feel almost, mm -hmm. a little bit. Yes, um, I was just thinking that. Yeah, so yeah. You, you you get that. Not not so much caves on all different levels going up, but the fact that you have, you know, kind of like a, 
um, not a sinkhole, but, you know, a canyon, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got, you know, you've got your caves and everything going, going off of that. So, um, so I really, I really like that. I would say, mm -hmm. you know, the thing that this adventure really kind of screamed to me was the, the interesting, the immersive part of the setting, yeah. um, you know, with the Absolutely. hill giant adventure, we get a, a, a fort out in the middle of nowhere and a dungeon mm -hmm. level. And how many times we've seen a dungeon level just like that. This one, we really get a very innovative setting. And I'll even go so far as to say even the fire giant lair, which we're going to get to in mm -hmm. three weeks, um, also not particularly innovative. Mm -hmm. And it was more of it was just yeah. here's a dungeon and here's a bunch of rooms and then a deeper dungeon and a deeper dungeon. So this one, um, I thought, really, really oozed that um, environment yeah. and everything. And, and I think that's really the crux of this adventure is the fact mm -hmm. that you are in you know, you're at the top of a, of an iceberg, basically, you know, not yeah. iceberg, uh, glacier. So I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I, I do feel that this one evokes that, that atmosphere better than G3. Um, you know, G3 had its moments and I guess we'll get into that in the next show, but this one, what could have just been a series of caves is really transformed simply by the environment. Cause you've got the wind, you've got the description of the high ledges, there's descriptions in various places of, you know, icicles falling in slippery ledges and, and you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and then one caverns got missed, you know, and, and places where characters can drop things and lose things in, in mm -hmm. I think, multiple locations, which I'm sure must have thrilled players back in the day. Um, so just really using that environment, um, you know, in many ways, I think the, the first level particularly just really sings because I, I love that map. There's mm -hmm. a certain elegance to that. It's it's a shockingly linear map in that it does, mm -hmm. you know, even though the characters can kind of take that fork and go either way, they're really channeled through a certain way and they have to come through a certain amount of guard rooms and such to get to where they're ultimately going. Yeah. Um, and yet there's an absolute illusion, I'll put it that way, illusion of freedom. Yes. Uh, you know, which we all know as DMs is kind of the way it always is, you know, that yeah. there there's always has to be some path, some plot, some map, you know, even if you're outdoors in the middle of the wilderness, there's always the DMs always got some channel that they're kind of funneling you through a little bit. And this one, though, just gives that complete feeling of we can go anywhere. And yet, you know, if you look at the map, there's a wonderful elegance to that map that um, to me, to me, it's a masterpiece of Gygaxian design that map, I could look mm -hmm. at it all day. Um, so yeah, agree wholeheartedly. Plus, there's a Remoraz in there, which is one of my all-time favorite creatures. <laughs> You're a dome so, of ice. <laughs> yeah, and and ice. that too. Like he could have just had that thing wandering around in the snow, which would have yeah. been boring. But to have this interesting ice formation that players are probably going to want to investigate, and then find this aura inside. Though there is a good treasure associated with the monster, so there's that. Yeah. Um, I think, again, it's just wonderful. And I think from the very, again, I'm a Trampier fan. From the very first moment, I looked at the Monster Manual as a kid. And I was pretty young when I got my first Master Manual. I saw the picture of the Remoras. And I remember thinking, like, well, I'm probably not going to use that a whole lot. But it was the coolest picture, I thought. So I was absolutely delighted when I saw the Remoras actually show up, you know, mm -hmm. in, in this module. So that's just like an added bonus if the characters actually go to the floor of the riff and, you know, start rooting around down there, you know, yeah. to run into that. C correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's only one way to get down to level two, correct? Is there just one passage? I think. I want to, there, I mean, at the bottom, there's a way that, you know, yep, that goes to level two. Now, I want to say that somewhere else, there, I there? thought there was a sinkhole or something. Oh, that, that I don't, yeah, might, maybe. I think there's a sinkhole somewhere on level okay. one that deposits you in level, but don't ask me what rooms. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm but, digging in my memory here. You but know? that's the, that's the, but that's you pretty would much never, it. you would never do that this, these days. You would never have one way you know, down to level two, you would always have, yeah. you know, a, a bunch of different ways and make it more interesting, um, in my opinion. But like I said, mm -hmm. you, the way the map is laid out and the way you have that central rift area, um, it gives you agency to think you can go wherever yeah. you want to go. 
um yeah. even though eventually you're out you're gonna get you're gonna get down that same way but like yeah. you think you've got all these different choices and mm -hmm. and you know one of those early times too when the the walls of the dungeon were removed you get down into the bottom of that rift and it's like literally it's like you can go any direction you want to go and you can't really see a whole lot because yeah. of yeah. the swirling snow and everything but but you're not constrained by you can go left or the corridor goes right and mm -hmm. you know there's no straight you can go whatever you want you can go up you can go down you can go you know so fascinating so i really it is. I, I really liked the maps of this one and i'll be honest yeah. with you too th this module was my favorite of the series mm -hmm. bar none it's, it's, it's to be honest with you it's not even close mm -hmm. um i was never a fan of g1 um i've come to respect it and like it better now Mm -hmm. um, in G3, I did like the ending of it and going into the Underdark and everything, but the actual um, the actual fire giant layers were not that compelling to me, um, but just the, the frost giant. And, you know, I think part of it might have been um, I played this one early on in my gaming career. I think it was the first time I ever played a high level character um and we didn't get through much of it but i remember that experience of getting through part of it and just being fascinated by ice caverns and a different mm -hmm. like the first time yeah. was not like in a classic dungeon basically so mm -hmm. uh, i will i will say on rereading them for like i think when i was young i i didn't like g1 at all mm -hmm. Yep. I liked g2 and i really liked g3 and i think in the years that have passed G2 has stayed right where it was. And I think, you know, G1 has risen up a little bit toward G2 and G3 has fallen down a little bit. So basically mm -hmm. almost to the point where G2 and G3 are about equal for me. Okay. Because again, I don't think G2, uh, you know, except for some lava on the bottom level and such, they didn't really make use of that uh, environment yeah. the way they could where this one that like, like I said, there's so much environment there, that, you know, it, it really is a, a, a distinct part of the module, you know, totally. It, it's almost a character to itself. Um, so yeah, no, I agree. And, and, and on rereading them for this show out of, and I recently reread all three modules. G2 is the one I want to play that mm -hmm. now that I'm seeing it again and reading again, I'm saying like, I've got to somehow play this with, you know, yeah. run this for my players, either spruce it up myself or use the, um, I think it's in Tales of the Owning Portal. They've got a yep. five port of it or something, but I want to get this thing and run it now that I've reread it. Just this yeah. one. I'm like, you know, I don't have to run the whole series, but I would be thrilled just to run G2. Yeah, um, yeah I agree. What, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, um, uh, some of the ham-fisted ways on getting you from adventure to adventure in this series. Um, <laughs> I mean, again, back in the day, um, you know, back in the late seventies and the early eighties, you know, there, there wasn't, there wasn't really campaigns and there wasn't story arcs and it wasn't, you know, it was more like, here's a dungeon. And I remember when yeah. we used to play, that's the way we used to play. We mm -hmm. used to be like, here's a dungeon and we would go through it. And then, Here's another one. We were at a desert one point, and we were in Arctic mm -hmm. the next point, and then we were, you know, in, in outer space the next. You know, <laughs> so it was like it was it. it that, I don't know. That was just kind of the way you did things, and 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 this one, you know, again, this was a tournament adventure, so that that tells you something right there. So you can yeah. literally see that that when they when they decided to to slap this one for sale, slap this together for sale. That you know, literally, they wrote like a couple little sentences, like, "Oh, you find a chain, and if you link the chain together, and everybody's holding hands, you'll teleport to the next module." And it's like, really? And it's like, you know, and it's like, even though there was a map, I think they did put a map in where you could find a map, like in the in the steeding at the the hill giant steeding, you could find a map to the rift, and then there's a map, I believe, in the rift that gets you to yeah uh, the things. And it but was it's always... it's hard. It's yeah. really, I mean, again, like you said, with you know, as designers ourselves with modern sensibilities, yeah, we would never be, I think, so obtuse about connecting the event, you know, because the chances, I mean, Gygax really was trying to evoke the cleverness of the draw, you know, and and yeah. and people, you know, behind this, uh, in the way that things were hidden magically and such, but there's no way the chances of the characters because I, I carefully checked at the end of this one and yeah there's two connections to yep. fire giants you have a almost next to each other you have the map and then you have yep. you know but just finding the magical teleportation devices i think it was like a one in six chance per yep. party 
per yeah. party, not yeah. per character. For so you have one, you rolled one d six for the party, and that's if they yeah. bothered to look, you know, for yep. this thing. Yeah. So yeah, almost impossible to find the connecting, you know, deceit here. So clearly, yeah. I think that would need a little updating, you know. Yeah, definitely. And and again, and and then if you get the world of Greyhawk maps and you see where they're actually located, they're, they're like hundreds of miles apart. Now maybe they're not hundreds of miles apart, but they're they're not close. They're the no, the, the no. things because obviously you have fire giants, you have frost giants, you have hill giants. They're they're not, you know, there's significant there was hexes between um yeah. be, be, between the layers. And and it was fascinating, but mm -hmm. it would also be really hard to literally okay. Now we're going to set off on a two hundred mile journey from this oh, hex yeah. to the next hex and find the lair. Because they know, give you the hexes on the if you're playing Greyhawk. Yeah, yeah. I, you know this one was in the what was it the Crystal Mists or whatever Crystal Mist Mountains. Yeah, Crystal Mist Mountains and in the Fire Giants is in the Hell Furnaces. In Hell Furnaces, yep. And yeah, they're, it's all on the western side of the map. But I mean, like you said, there's just many, many hexes in between. You know these different and the other one was what up somewhere in Geoff or someplace. Yep. And, yep. Uh, you're, you're talking days and days of travel between you know the two. So it's nice to say there's a map, but <laughs> yeah. And it was and yeah. it was uphill both ways. So in the snow. <laughs> in the, in snow. the snow. In the yes. snow. Yep. So or the lava. <laughs> Either way. So yeah. So that I mean that part, you know, again, and this is we look back at these classic ones and, and again, these were these are the these are the first ones that TSR ever published. And yeah. some of the first ones they published. And you know, they didn't they probably were not thinking back then, oh, or you know, people are gonna want a logical way to get between these two. Mm -hmm. Like let's just link them somehow, like you know, yeah, and and kind of you know, wave your hand and don't look behind the curtain too much and and then we'll have them, you know, make it to the next the next encounter and all that. I mean, at least once you got to the underdark, it made a little bit more sense because you yeah. were traveling and it was, mm -hmm. you know, and then you got that nice underground map and everything. And it just, yeah. you know, it got, it definitely picked up. And even though you were still dealing with, with quite a, you know, the distances were, were very large at that too. But, you know, again, you were mm -hmm. kind of back down into the, into the caverns and you were restricted by your choices there. So, um, so what else you got on this one before we jump into our top five list? You got anything else you want to? I was I with. covered it. What do you think about the inclusion of the dragons? Um, um, I love the dragons. you've included those in, in your top five, in which case, you yeah. Know, um, no, I, I liked, there. um, I, I guess the, uh, this is this is kind of a tangential thing to, to go as. I actually like the mix of monsters in this in general. Mm -hmm. I felt that I felt that the the hill giant um module was a little too much hill giants and ogres and then you get to the lower level it's like orcs and bugbears and yeah. you know there was a couple of other things here and there but for the most part it felt a lot like let's bring back B2 again when you get into the orc lair it's like a yeah. lot of orcs and everything yeah um, I felt that they did a really nice job with there wasn't just frost giants you know, you had Yeti, you had ogres, you had some mm -hmm. emissaries of different um, different uh, giantess species. Uh, you had your Remoraz, you had your white pudding, which was awesome. That mm -hmm. you just took a black pudding and put white in front of it, and you're like, "Hey, yep. try and figure out what that's all about." Um, <laughs> you know, you had uh, ice toads, you had polar bears, you had um, winter wolves. You you had a yeah. you had a really nice yeah. mixture of things going on mm -hmm. that I think kind of kept the encounters a little. You know, they weren't so samey. Um, yeah, and and I kind of like that. And you had the white dragons, and and I mean, you know, again, dragon is the name of the game. And yeah, it's like yeah, I, I always feel like you know, in all these years, dragons haven't been featured probably prominently, um, yeah. like they probably should have been. I mean, you know, when you you know, just just for example, you know, when when we get the the Harry Potter world, it's like Harry Potter's name is in the titles of all the books, Harry Potter and the whatever, mm -hmm. and because it's all about Harry Potter, you know, yeah. it's like it's like, and he's like front and center, and and he's there, and it's like, you know, I think we got the dungeon part down. I'm mm -hmm. so sure we've got the dragon part down, even almost yeah. fifty years later, and it's like I feel like it's such a a classic trope in that, yeah, but it's not it's not done enough. Um, yeah, and and oh, I almost like to see more. Um, my my parent, uh, you know, my players will tell you about five years ago. I sat down with my players and you know, kind of DM the player, and I basically told them that my intent was to start bringing in more of the classic monsters. You know, basically mm -hmm. because we've all done the orcs on the road or whatever so many times yeah. that 
I wanted to see hydras. I wanted to see beholders. I wanted to see dragons. And, you know, granted, some of the stuff is higher level stuff. So, you yep, you know, definitely. you can't make it fly if it's a third level party or whatever. But basically, I I, I dedicate and, and I've kept that to this day where I really dedicated myself to trying to use these creatures that I always wanted to see. And I'm happy to say, like, my my car, uh, my players did run into a beholder, you know, and they did. Because mm -hmm. how many how many D&D &D players know what a beholder is it's on yeah. the cover of every book practically that you know wizards puts out and yet how many players then out of that have actually run into one you know or encountered one it's probably like five percent or something of the same players who automatically know what a beholder is which to me is just it's i agree it's it's like outright criminal you know we we yeah. need more of those great classic monsters you know yeah so i i agree yeah i think the high level thing is part of it I yeah, think, but you had such a variety of dragons, and then you had the different age classes, and you had sure. different sizes. Back in the old day, there was size, and mm -hmm. there was the age class, so you could have like a small, young, and it was like they didn't have a yeah. whole. I mean, things a lot of things didn't have a lot of hit points. I mean, a, an ancient red dragon back in the day only had eighty-eight hit points, not like only, but yeah, you know, no, but I I don't want to say like giants and dragons were easy, but. I think when you go from first edition to later editions, giants and dragons definitely turned up the heat. You know, they yeah. definitely took those and they real like they took the red dragon and really made it just you know yes yes a killer. like like they probably should be all the time. But yes, right. you're right. Which I which yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with, but I, I just think in in first edition particularly, dragons and giants are more approachable. You know, yeah, they are a certain level. You know, they're not the death sentence. They they might you know that an adult. Uh, like red dragon or older would be now so exactly yeah i agree i totally agree cool okay all right yes uh and g blasters dropping lots of comments here yes bring me all the winter monsters that's what they did on this one and yeah, next time they, it's they gonna certainly be bring me did all the fire monsters <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um all right well let's get into our top five all right let's uh, do it for this adventure um do you want to go i can't remember we should keep i don't know first and everything um, so. Do honorable mentions first. You, uh, sure. you said you had an honorable mention. So why don't you lay me out with your honorable mention? Okay. Um, and I'm wagering a bet right here and now that my honorable mention will be one of your five, but we'll okay. see. Okay. Um, my honorable mention, and it's kind of two conjoined areas. Um, and I mine my five are all encounters. So okay. I know I think you have a mix, but I for whatever reason I ended up all encounters this time. My honorable mention is areas 11 and 12 on the upper level, the cave of bones and the lower bone cave. Um, this is that area where it's a sort of refuse area. There's bones strewn all around. And then as the characters delve a little deeper, they're deep, deeper they run into their first bunch of uh, ice toads that attack them. And these toads, interestingly, are sort of semi-worshipping this little lump of, you know, crystal or something that, you know, this valuable, of course, lump of crystal that looks like, you know, a, a toad. And I just thought that was like a cool little touch. It's a neat little area. It's one of the first places on the one side where you kind of run into a different type of, you know, creature that's mm -hmm. not a humanoid or a giant. Um, so I just thought that little weird little touch about the ice toad sort of worshiping this valuable item that the players might want to make off with was just a nicely bizarre little touch. Um, so that gets my honorable mention, just that little okay. cool. dual area. And like you said, now with the later edition, we had that cool picture of, of, yes. of yeah. that. I'm going to say it's from that encounter. There are some ice toads yeah. on a lower level someplace too, but I, I like to think that's from this, this area. So exactly. <laughs> picture. Yeah. Okay, so my honorable mention um, is actually the uh, Jarl's Private Caverns. Yeah. That's level two, area twenty-one, mm -hmm. um, and it's strange. This one's a, it's a little interesting. There's a there's a lot going on in here. Again, it's also a couple of rooms, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's the Jarl actually himself uh, outfitted with some very cool magic items, uh, which again was interesting to see. It was interesting to see um, a a an npc or a, or a villain if you will have like a plus four two-handed sword and like a magic shield and things and a, yeah. and a special special armor i like that and i like the fact that the jarl fought as a cloud giant so it was like instead of <laughs> restatting him up again economy of words here instead of restatting him up 
yeah just basically saying he just basically fights as a, as a cloud giant go look those stats up um on your own and everything so i, I really like that obviously he had a lot of hit points but what i really liked about this and this is probably the first event first module that i started noticing this and definitely in the chronolog chronology of, of when these were published the detail to the treasure i think is just fascinating yeah um i, I just i can't get over how sometimes just a couple little words, a, a platinum horn studded mm -hmm. with gems, and just like yeah. you know, it it wasn't it wasn't just a piece of jewelry worth eight thousand gold pieces. It was it was it was a couple of extra little lines, and I've always taken that to heart, and I've always mm -hmm. in my adventures, you know, made it a point to like not not say a piece of jewelry worth eleven hundred GP, but instead, yeah. Yeah. what is yeah. it? Is it a gold necklace? Is it an anklet? Is it a ring? Is yeah. it a, a a crown? Is it a tiara? So it's like I, I just I really really love the detail on some of the mm -hmm. treasure. I've, the the queen has um or the lady I guess it is. She's a saber tooth tiger cloak. I mean mm -hmm. just just like you know you didn't have to put that detail in. Almost yeah. like you said with the yeah. with with the toad, the little crystal toad thing. You didn't have yeah. to put that in, but you did, and it just it just brought you to the next level. So um and it then I said there was a lot of stuff going on in this room. There was some hidden treasure. There was a an invisible chest which you would like never find up on a ledge i think too. <laughs> yeah and then there was the same with the the lever the teleport lever so yeah it was mm -hmm. just there was a there was lots of this room but again you know this i i could easily put this in my list but i had to definitely call it out because it was mm -hmm. definitely there was a lot of detail put into into this yeah there. and and there should have been this was the big bad so uh i see that so yeah the detail the the detail is just wonderful um mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I've heard Gygax's style at times described as, you know, dry and this and that. But I think he was a master of detailing, you know, areas and detailing treasure in particular. Because yeah. like you said, I've seen even like I remember in second edition, particularly there were certain modules that they just say, oh, you find 2000 gold piece. And it was like the laziest thing to me because it would be exactly yeah. 2000 gold yeah. pieces. Yep. It wouldn't be any description. And here you get this really wonderful, well-realized layer, you know, and and yeah. individuals, and it feels very alive. So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't classify that as dry at all. And 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 addressing your comments, guy, too. I love Adiogs. I pronounce them that way. My players are sick of them. I love them so much. So. <laughs> <laughs> every time they go into some cave and like some little tentacle pops up out of a pile of you know, <laughs> garbage that has an eye on it or something they are like here goes rick again so yeah uh definitely get my vote for the audiogs all right so we're on number five we're on uh, number five all right uh my number five is area 21 on the upper level ice cavern i guess they're all called like ice cavern but uh, this is the one that has the brown mold with the warning rune in front of it, in front of, uh, in, in, you know, Frost Giant, which I think is really clever because, um, you know, here you have this weird ruin that can kind of frighten or spook the players, but they may not know what it is. And a lot of characters are probably not going to speak Frost Giant, but there's a chance that characters could either magically or otherwise just somehow decipher this thing and realize what the threat here is. And again, it contributes to the feeling of a lived in lair that the giants have been all through these caves and they found something unpleasant here. That's dangerous even to them. And they put up a, you know, and it's like you said, it's like that next level of detail, instead of just throwing some Brown mold in the cave, Gygax put the warning ruin in there and put that extra level of detail on top of it, which then really provides a whole, you know, extra experience for the players because now they can find this ruin investigate it try to translate it cast spells etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh for those reasons that's an easy number five is the ice cavern uh, area 21 cool excellent um my number five is somewhat of a crossover already <laughs> <laughs> um so i just went instead of picking an ice toad encounter i just went with the ice toad because okay. I just think the ice toad is fascinating. And mm -hmm. and why is it fascinating? All you need to do is go to the monster manual and look up giant toad. It's under T. Um, and look at the entry to ice toad compared to the other toads. I think there's giant toad and I think there's this killer frog. There's something poison. I don't yeah, know. There's, there's, there's three. There's three. Yeah. But the ice toad is somewhat intelligent. It has an yeah. intelligence of like eight to ten um has its own 
as they say, weird language, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of kind of crazy. It has a fondness for collecting treasure. It's like the only of the toads. It's the only thing that has a chance for treasure. Um, it radiates cold, so when you get near it, you just take damage. And I, I actually love that. And it's it's a lot of damage. It's three to eighteen points of damage is you know that's a lot to stand near this thing and you're going to take damage from it unless you're protected yeah. revolt. that's just that's terrible um <laughs> so i was just again and and the whole the whole little purple amethyst thing like the the chris thing that was just like the ice the, the cherry on top but yeah. but i just i just loved the the whole concept of the ice toad i love the concept of a toad living in the arctic i just thought mm -hmm. that was You'd never expect to find a toad, you know, in, in yeah. the Arctic. So um, for all those reasons, um, big fan of mm -hmm. of of the ice toads in general. Um, uh, to be honest with you, for many years, I always thought these were a new monster that was introduced in this adventure. I always mm -hmm. thought that in the back of the adventure, there was a little a full write up on them and everything. Mm -hmm. And I was wrong about that. It's like they were in the monster manual the whole time. Um, but you know, they were in a chart with two other toads, so they kind of got yeah. lost in the shuffle, I think. But, um, but yeah, fascinating. Love the ice toad, can't get enough of them. Uh, yeah. that's my number five. Nice, and yeah, the fact that he described the treasure in the way he did, making use of their intelligence for that encounter yes. and, and their love of their proclivity for treasure is just. I always viewed that as being a really dangerous encounter, too. Yeah, I think, oh, yeah. you know, any, any, any players who do a lot of Gygax and uh, adventures, I think between the village and Hamlet and this, they've yes. somebody's going to lose a character to a, a frog or a toad or something along the line <laughs> at some point, right? <laughs> All right. So my number four um, is Area 6 on the lower level. This is the Emissary's Cavern. Uh, this is the Ogre Magi sort of uh, lair. I like the detail here. Um, you know, you have placement markers for the Ogre Magi. They're kind of well detailed, this area. It, instead of just saying, oh, there's 15 Ogres here or whatever, they kind of go into a lot more detail. And then the icing on top is they describe one of their treasures being this trick box that sort of contains a box of holding within it. And you have to slide these different plates of different metal in different directions, you know, and they, you're literally kind of given the recipe that the characters have to use to open up this crazy trick box, you know. Um, again, treasure taken to the next level. It's just, I found that trick box really interesting. Um, I've gone as far as with my players is actually buying physical wooden trick boxes and putting them on the table and making my poor players try to open them up. So I love that kind of stuff. So to have something like that presented as part of their treasure, I thought was just bringing it to the next level. So that was my number four, the, uh, Ogre Magi, I will call it area. It's the Emissary's Cavern on, on the lower level. Cool. Awesome. Great. Um, my number four is on level one area five uh dubiously labeled the ice cavern <laughs> uh, so this is the one with eight frozen mutilated corpses that are stood upright and they're basically like scarecrows i don't know why frost giants would need scarecrows but um basically uh they were frozen in in transparent blocks of ice um and they were clearly adventurers um, and 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 they go through and give a little description of of all eight of them. You have a dwarf with an axe. You have an elf with a wand. A uh, half elf, I believe it is, with a, a mm -hmm. sack that's spilling out coins. Clearly, the the rogue there. Um, I, I always liked it. It was it was an. It's not really much of an encounter. Um, mm -hmm. Although, hey, <laughs> although um, there were rules that if you used the fireball, to, mm -hmm. if you were like, oh, we're just gonna use a fireball to to melt them and get to their goodies, because they all clearly had some goodies. Yeah. Um, you, some good you goodies. Just, yes, you would destroy the magic and or yeah. the the jeweled object. So I thought that was cool. And mm -hmm. then they went a step further to say that you know if you use the lesser fire or chiseled it out. Like there was a cumulative chance that you would yeah. cause a, a ceiling collapse for six to sixty damage, which yeah. is crazy back in first edition. I mean, to be able to take forty or fifty points of damage in one shot is that that's yeah. the, the, the wizard's not getting through that. So um I love that, but that was great because mm -hmm. you know, if you took the time and you were careful, you would get some really good loot out of the deal. But if you didn't take the time and you weren't careful, you probably got punished yeah. for it um and yeah. and it was pretty harsh so so again it was like treasure that was kind of laying out there unguarded but was it really unguarded mm -hmm. and, it, and it made sense 
you know, would not have made sense for there to be some sort of weird elaborate trap there. But the yeah. fact that, well, the ceiling, the ice ceiling could collapse on you. That makes sense. I, I like it. There's a little bit of dungeon ecology going on there. And, and I found that fascinating. So that's my number four, uh, level one, area five, the ice cavern. Nice. Well, mine going on to my number three. Uh, my number three is area five on the upper level. There it is. So, you know what's really funny? Real quick, real quick. My number three is level two, area six, the Ogre Magi episode. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> this is why we get along, folks. Um, I I love this area. We I I think you know you've 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 mentioned when we review some modules about there are certain areas that you picture when you think of. For whatever reason, I think this room plus the ice toads and one or two other things is what, aside from just the whole rift, is what snaps into my mind when I think of this module. For some reason, I always think of this cave with the blocks of ice. Um, it reminds me a lot of that statuary hall in the Temple of Elemental Evil where there are all the statues with the magic items, which I, I've talked about how I love these areas where, you know, you have these different items to, you know, mirrors or statues or things. To, and same here, you've got your different blocks of ice. I love the risk reward kind of ratio there where the players want to, you know, kind of take their chances and go chipping away and, and try to get a certain amount of loot. They're really almost rolling the dice as to when these icicles are going to come down on them. Um, and I thought it was interesting. There's other caves with collapsing ceilings of ice, but the damage was much worse in this particular cave. I think in other areas, it's like three to 30 or something, but here it's six to 60. Mm -hmm. So there's a really, you know, real punishing, you know, uh, you know, bad outcome. If you push your luck, so we say too hard, you know, so love it love this area i almost rated it higher frankly on my on my list uh i could have easily done that um yeah i just i really like this area like you said it's not maybe a traditional encounter but it's sort of like a puzzle you know so yeah uh, for me for the characters you know how they go about getting this treasure you know because there's clearly some valuable stuff in there that the characters could you know could benefit the characters on the adventure so it behooves them to try to get their hands on some of these goodies, you know, and this was back in the day when treasure equal experience. So yes, yes. there's that, um, yes. you know, so uh, characters back then didn't just walk by, uh, you know, 12,000 GP necklace. <laughs> no. So anyway, wholeheartedly agree area five. All right. And again, my number three, a crossover as well, level two, right. area six, the Ogre Magi, the Emissaries, um, again, and for all the reasons that um, that Rick mentioned, uh, yes, the fact that there were numbers on the map, which was great, that showed you their locations, although it was kind of weird that they're just standing in those locations, kind of, and maybe they're frozen in space, you know, they, maybe they couldn't move. <laughs> um, but yeah, really, I love the extra detail about this encounter, the fact that there was the letter from their Lord pledging service for how much money, uh, I think it was 100,000 gold pieces plus whatever they could carry, you know, from the raids. Um, but the iron, the, the, the iron box, the puzzle box, which was the box of holding, that took it to the next level. That The detail on that, and it was fascinating. And I guess same thing, I remember my characters uh, that when we were playing it, they were fascinated over that box. That box was amazing, even though it poisoned them so many times um, with the needles and everything. But like, it just, it was just different. You know, it was like, yeah. it just, it opened up that world to, wait, you can have a box of holding? Like, whoa. So you can have a bag of holding. Why, you can have a pouch of holding. You can have a backpack of holding. You can have, what are those things that like, I guess when you're a kid, you don't think about. Until mm -hmm. it's presented to you, you're like, well, yeah, who says you can't have a box of holding yeah. or whatever of holding? Yeah. So, yeah, love that. So uh, so that is my number three, uh, the Emissary's Cavern, uh, Area 6 on level two. Nice. Variants on a theme. And and I have to address a comment from the history professor. Um, I did not always have this. <laughs> wow. Who thought the beard was going to be I know, like right? thing? We should I, do a beard people show. People notice right the now. details, boy. These folks yes. notice the details. We can't slip. We can't. You can't slip a, a beard by these folks. But as I said, I said as I said to somebody at, at, at my real life job, uh, you know, if you take a long winter break and you don't grow a beard, like what's the point? But whether it lasts or not, I, I, I starting to get that satanic look. I'm not sure how long I'm going to keep it. It's itching me terribly. So we'll see <laughs> whether it makes it to the next <laughs> show or two. So where are we? Number, Number two. Area. Two. All right. 
Uh, for my area two, again, I, I cheated and I kind of took a couple uh, linked areas. Uh, this would be areas 11 through 13 on the lower level. This is basically the great cavern hall kind of complex down there uh, where you have the approachment hall plus the little DS area and, you know, rear area. I, I love the grandness of this chamber. I really like those two high uh, ledge kind of guard positions where not only are there frost giants up there, but they have ballistae yes. that they can shoot at you. So it's just <laughs> clearly a really, and they're up there in the shadow. So they could really be, you know, plus they have things to throw. So characters just kind of waltzing into this deserted grand hall could really be met with a, a rude surprise. Plus you have some guards positioned very care, you know, cleverly kind of behind the throne area. Um, I just think it's a cool, grand, well-realized area. I can very much picture this great majestic cavern with these, you know, this kind of high ceiling and, and these high ledges. I just think it gives a lot of personality that, frankly, the lower level doesn't have as much as the upper level and needs. So I was really happy to see this area down there because it really shouted to me, okay, this is a cool area. This speaks Frost Giant to me. Um, so just for, even though there's not, you know, a huge active encounter here, I think you could have a really fun fight here with the guards mm -hmm. and such up on the ledges, you know, or even potentially flying characters at that level or something. So just for the atmosphere and such, uh, that made my number two, the, the great yeah. cavern, uh, cavern hall complex. All right. Um, so my number two is, oh, this is ironic. I didn't even realize this, uh, level two. Area two, <laughs> my number two, 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 two. Uh, two, two we should two. make a breakfast out of that or something. Uh, that is the vaulted cavern. This is the white dragon lair. Mm. Oh, you tried to tease that out of me earlier. You tried to <laughs> either unveil all of my white dragon secrets, and I definitely kick save and a beauty. Um, so keeping on the ice theme here, kick save. Mm -hmm. Uh, so anyway, this is a wonderful dragon lair, and again, we talked about this a little bit at length about how D D needs more dragons. Uh, this was great. Uh, first of all, there was boulders that you needed to move to get into here. So while you're moving this boulder and making all sorts of noise, the dragon, of course, gets into position and is ready mm -hmm. to surprise. That's what I really liked about this. That it's not just a dragon sitting on a pile of treasure and you can sneak up on it and and yeah. and, and take it. Um, you have two dragons. The second dragon stays hidden, so you don't even know there's a second dragon in there. And think about it, folks. Um, you know, the 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 first dragon surprises you on a three to six mm -hmm. um on 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 a die six roll. That's pretty that's that that's that's pretty impressive that he's gonna most likely surprise you. What's a dragon gonna do if he surprises you? He's gonna breathe. And I mean, I mean, and and back in first edition, dragons when they breathe, they did the damage equal to their maximum hit points. So <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. So good point. That was it was serious. I remember yeah. my yeah. group getting in there and almost having a TPK mm -hmm. in that opening round because sure. of the, the breath weapon. And yeah. like, if you didn't make your saving throw, you were in bad shape. And then, and then, like a round or two later, another dragon comes in that can surprise mm -hmm. you even more. Is, yeah. is is nuts and so i love that i love the fact that there was the ledge in the back so that other dragon could be up on that ledge so it's like a 30 foot ledge i get yeah. it they're high level characters but make them cast fly make them levitate mm -hmm. or or climb but something again environment make them make them work at yeah. it so that they yeah. can't just walk right up to it and start whacking at it with its sword maybe the rogue can get up there maybe the wizard can get up there but can the fighter get up there quickly mm -hmm. probably not yeah. Um, so I think that's what makes this encounter fascinating. And then again, I'm going to bring it back to treasure again. It's mm -hmm. like, if you don't realize that you look at everything on the treasure list, it's all white colored. It's, it's all like white or silver. It's like there's silver coins, electrum coins, platinum coins, no gold, yeah. no copper. Yeah. There was alabaster. There was ivory. There was pewter mm -hmm. and it, there were diamonds. And it was like, wow, it was like, again, a, a simple little touch. Mm -hmm. But like it just yeah. it just made a lot of sense. And it was like that yeah. first time I think I realized that it's like you can actually have some fun designing treasure hoards that have mm -hmm. like a theme to themselves and all that. So yeah. I absolutely, absolutely love that. So really love that encounter. I it's it's ironic. I I really th I, obviously my my next my number one is actually not an encounter. So this is mm -hmm. my favorite encounter. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I, I just love it to death. I could have easily made it my number one. Mm -hmm. So that that it's not on my list, but could have easily uh, 
and I've always loved that sort of, I want to call it abandoned wing of, or whatever you yes. want to call it, or yep. that roost wing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I consider like the first three kind of caves, you know, the, the there's a dragon cave and an abandoned kind of storeroom. And then this whole roost area where there's more ice toads and there's a kind of, you know, fake body that's placed by the drow and that whole section of the dungeon I always felt was the coolest thing. Like I yeah. could literally take that whole section and just put it on my list easily because um, not only, like you said, do you have a well-realized dragon layer with good tactics about the, you know, the second dragon flying in kind of silently yes. to the yeah. aid of, you know, her mate and that, that all that stuff, it's just, it sings, it's, it's great. Uh, so yeah, good pick, good pick. All right, we're down to big number one, but um, yes. this one um might seem a little anticlimactic, but it's it's very much in the style of stuff I like. It's uh, area twenty on the lower level. This is the Jarl's anti cavern and trophy hall. Now, obviously, not a populated area, you know, not an area that has giants just lounging in it to fight, but there's so much cool stuff here to explore. And like we just discussed, there's there's I think like an ivory covered you know uh, horn of Valhalla that looks like a tusk and you know some trapped items and 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 there's a cool kind of trap where the Shido skull starts yelling you know in giant if you touch one of the other valuable treasures and just a lot of I, I, to me I have so much fun as a DM when my and and I think my players too like when I present them with ruins uh, rooms where the players can poke around and look at different yes. things and explore. Yes. I anybody who's read my adventures knows I love trophy rooms like that like this. I've definitely been inspired by this kind of room in Gygax's writings and used it my you know come up with things like this myself where I put in a whole bunch of odd little you know tidbits for the players to examine and poke around about. So. Um, you know, like even in the, when we did the ore version of Temple of Elemental Evil, I did a curio shop and there's a room where I have a curio shop and I have all these funky things in there for the characters to poke around and look at, you know, skulls and maps and things because I love that. So that's my area one, just because of the uh, same as we've described with the treasure, just the the level of detail about talking about all the different items and the, and the, the traps and could have just been a boring trophy room full of stuffed heads but no yeah. you know Gygax takes it to the next level so I was surprised it made my number one the way things shook out but uh, I'm I'm cool with that so nice. uh yeah here's to the awesome. trophy hall <laughs> yes very true I I I was this close I was this close that one could have made it that one could have, could have <laughs> definitely made it um my number one is not an encounter um, and we're going to kind of come all the way back to kind of where we started with this one. And, and mm -hmm. it is the environment of the rift mm -hmm. in general. Um, and what I love is in the introductory paragraphs of this adventure, Gygax spends so much time kind of laying the foundation for this environment. Um, how it's the, the entrances are the fact that it's a rift and that you could theoretically walk over on top of the caves Mm -hmm. And you could throw a rope down and actually enter the caves that way if you wanted to. He had rules for slipping mm -hmm. and sliding, going yeah. over the edge. Yet, because there was a good chance you'd slip and slide, there was a little bit of game balancing there where he said, oh, but the maximum damage you could take is 10 die 6 because, um, you know, there's snow banks you would probably fall in. So I like that. I kind of like yeah. that little... Yeah. That little balancing factor because quite frankly there's probably a good chance people are going to be slipping and sliding you mm -hmm. know if you cast a fireball or use a lot of fire you're going to cause fog and you're going to mm -hmm. make things even slip more slipperier i mean he spent about i don't know if it was quite half a page but mm -hmm. it was somewhere between a quarter maybe a third of a page maybe and mm -hmm. if you think the thing is only five and a half pages long a third to yeah. a half of a page of that specifically just laying out there all the environment all the cool environment um uh opportunities that you could have the three dimensions of the rift and everything um i loved it i mean i love mm -hmm. the the howling of the wind the visibility just yeah. everything it just again added the ambiance on it made it kind of feel like there i thought it was really kind of you know perfect that we were doing this review for this module um mm -hmm. in in january and not in july <laughs> so yeah, it's just, yeah. yeah it'd be awesome if there was some snow out there in new jersey yeah. we've kind of had a a very warm, um, you know, and, and and no snow this year, so that's kind of a bummer. But I'm sure where a lot of folks are, they have more <laughs> snow than they they yeah. want to deal with. I'm looking at you, Buffalo. Um, yep. But yeah, so just fascinating. Um, I, mm -hmm. I so that's my number one is just the whole the whole rift environment and the whole 
kind of everything all together um yeah. love it and and that's what i you know that's what i kind of remind, remind myself mm-hmm. of this adventure most of the time so so there you have it folks that's nice. our top five so we had a little bit of crossover not as much as i thought we were going to have mm-hmm. um in a top five so it's tricky when there's not that many encounters to pick from or should i say not many media encounters we're not going to be thinking, enc- yeah we yeah don't we're pick not going to pick room with eight frost giants in it yeah. so that one's probably not going to make it although maybe i should yeah. do that next time just for fun it's like yes <laughs> i like the room with the eight frost giants so there we go um, but uh yeah so uh rick tell them what you got to tell them sure well as always folks uh we're delighted you could join us if you're enjoying what you're seeing please give us a like, give us a follow. If you're watching later on YouTube and you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. It helps us and keep those comments coming. Now, looking on to our next show, I'm already psyched for that one. Uh, It's coming your way on February 19th, the usual time of 8 p.m. And we're going to go right, follow right through with the Giant series and delve into the Hall of the Fire Giant King. Another classic, another favorite of mine. I know I say that every week, but it's really true. I really like the fire giant just as much as I like this one. So uh, we're very much excited to come back your way in February with that. So I hope you can join us. And then, uh, and then folks, we're going to take a very short break off of um, the giant modules. After that, before we jump into the D series, we have a really cool show after uh, our February 19th show. Um, We tell you what it was, but we don't exactly know right now. We have a theme picked out. We just have a, figured out exactly um, working out the details but it's going to be a little it'll be a little different than normal um but it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun so uh stay tuned for that um and then with that we've got our pearls of wisdom um i guess i'll jump in first since you go for the rundown there um so i'm gonna say you know i think we've talked about this before i'm not necessarily gonna say environment being important or interesting Mm -hmm. i'm gonna say dungeon ecology things that make sense Mm-hmm. And, and again, it doesn't need to make complete sense. It just, just needs to be a little bit of reasoning. Like we talked about how, you know, if you if, if you chisel away at the ice, there's a chance it will collapse. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's a, a manufactured trap. It's a hazard more, but it, it kind of makes sense. It makes sense mm-hmm. that if you make a lot of noise in this room, maybe you're going to cause a collapse or something. Mm-hmm. If you cast a fireball, the, the floors are going to get more slippery because it's going to thaw and then freeze and it's going to get that fresh kind of like a Samboni effect. Um, and then, you know, um, you're going to cause a fog. So it's like things like that, I think, is 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 fascinating to me. And I, I like mm-hmm. a little bit of that. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect where everything makes sense. But, you know, if you've got a trap at the entrance, there should be a way that the that the denizens of the dungeon can get around it like or disable it or something it shouldn't be something that there's literally only trigger it or not mm-hmm. so um and sometimes you know just thinking those couple little details through and like we we talked about this uh, you know our favorite encounters almost in, in invariably were the ones that they just thought it uh, they took it a next step they just said oh what if and just a little bit better so so dungeon ecology is kind of my pearl wisdom mm-hmm. for for the week Nice. I, I officially approve. Um, my Pearl of Wisdom is somewhat tangentially related to that and definitely related to the atmosphere that we keep coming back to, which is just, uh, and I've kind of said this before, is for DMs to, you know, not be afraid to throw uh, a change from the norm at your players, especially if things start, you know, feeling like they're in a rut. Um, you know, I, I ran into a period few years back in my own campaign where things were starting to feel samey samey and the characters were using a transportation device to come back from their latest adventure and it's a long story but the way the characters used the device was in a very odd way and it gave me kind of an opportunity to have the device malfunction and i decided i was just going to throw them into the land of the lost right out of the tv show nice basically literally they heard a crack and a boom when they went through this sort of teleportation you know portal or whatever next thing you know they were tumbling over the falls literally into the land of the dinosaurs and they had to spend the next four or five sessions trying to figure out their way out of the land of the lost and i did the land of the lost with the dinosaurs and the sea stack and the pillars and everything and the characters i think they would definitely had their fill of dinosaurs by the time that the players got out there but it was good because it shook up things it put them in this jungle environment all of a sudden completely different from the environment they were in you know it changed up the whole kind of monster ecology 
And I tried to present details that rode off of that, the same way Gygax presented details in this, where by describing the misty caverns and the chance of losing things in the cracks in the floor and the chance of icicles coming down from the ceiling or the you know reduced falling damage from the snow, those are all details where Gygax doesn't just give you a description of the environment, but then he follows up on it by giving you those details, you know, in the various rooms that back that up. And that's taking it to the next level, as you just said, you know, in my mind. Um, so that's my advice for the, you know, the DMs is if you're sticking to the same hilly environment or same, you know, dark forest or whatever you do, shake it up, get, you know, we've, I've talked about the importance of environment, but here the importance is changing that environment, giving your characters, you know, taking them and putting them someplace else, whether it's extra plane or underwater, anything, get them out of that. And, and, and because here just bringing the characters into that rift really knocked the players off balance, I think, and made them think in a different way. And I think that's always a good thing. So that's my pearl of wisdom is just, you know, shake things up with your environment in a big way. Occasionally. Excellent. 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 Sounds good. So, well, thanks everybody out there uh, watching you. us live. Um, or if you're watching us on YouTube afterwards, uh, we will be back in three weeks for another episode. And we're going to do a deep dive into G3. So everybody have a good rest of your Sunday and so long for now, guys. Good night, folks. Bye.